In May of 2016, I became the first American woman to summit Everest without the use of supplemental oxygen. <laughs> You guys, I just walk uphill slowly. It's really not that big of a deal. <laughs> it was my sixth summit of Everest, and it was something that I had worked towards for eight years. I am a mountain guide. It's what I do. I spend my life in the mountains, but didn't always start that way. I grew up, like most little kids, just cute and playing in the snow. <laughs> I had parents who were incredibly economically poor, but put a really high priority on happiness. My father was what I would describe as um, authentically hippie, if you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and as I grew up, as all children do, I rebelled. He just wanted me to live in the back of my truck and ski all year and be dirty and definitely under any and all circumstances not work for the man. <laughs> so when I was 14, I became very close to finishing high school. And when I was 15, I graduated high school early and I told this man that I was going to go to college. And he was very disappointed in me. He, he was. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine telling this man you're going to go to college, and that you're going to go to college in Iowa, and that you're going to get a business degree. And he told me that in the money I was going to spend at one year in college, I could probably ski every day of the year and rent a hotel room once a week to take a shower. But. I was like, Dad, I feel like education is important. So I went to school, I got a business degree, and I was working writing ads for Procter & Gamble, living in Iowa, and I was super happy. I went back west to visit my parents, who were at that point living in Montana on sort of a commune thing, and I saw the mountains for the first time. I'd been surrounded by them my whole entire life, and I just never left and come back. And I saw them for the first time. And I had a friend who took me climbing, and I realized that it fulfilled something in me that I'd really been looking for. I had always been very athletic, but never very competitive. And climbing was exactly that. It wasn't competitive, but it required athleticism. It required effort. It required commitment. So I quit my job. I packed everything in the back of my truck. And I drove west with $2,000, which I figured was about enough on my dad's math to like get about six months <laughs> if I couch surfed. <laughs> and I definitely didn't eat organic food, and um, I dedicated myself to learning the craft of climbing. I learned ice climbing, rock climbing, and mountaineering, and that brought me out here to Washington State, where I started working as a professional guide on Mount Rainier in 2004. My first time climbing Rainier, I came down and I said, that was wonderful, I'm probably never going to do that again. I've summited Mount Rainier 110 times. <laughs> so basically, I'm a liar. <laughs> but mostly just to myself. And it's one of those mental tricks where I just said, you know what, this is an experience, I want to take it all in because I might never get a chance to do this. And that's how I've approached every opportunity that I've had in climbing. Climbing has taken me all over the world. I quickly started being able to guide in South America. And then after three years of guiding, when I was only 24 years old, I got the opportunity to go as an assistant guide on an expedition to Mount Everest. I wouldn't do it as a lead guide, I didn't have the experience. I was incredibly intimidated, but I wanted to see the Himalayas. I wanted to go and be surrounded by the highest mountains in the world. And immediately, I was distracted by all of the climbing that could be done. It was obvious that I was in a place that really felt like my home. And one of the things that most represented my home was people who were hardworking and put a high priority on happiness. And it was something that I recognized from my own family. And in the culture in Nepal, the mountain workers are not typically women. The women run everything else, though. <laughs> Working in the mountains is the job that the men typically go and do. So it took a little bit of effort for me to communicate to the local workers that I wasn't a tourist there, that I was there to work alongside them and not have them help me, but I was there to just work with them. And I was very committed to it right away, and I realized it was a place that I wanted to spend a lot of time. The Everest expedition, does anybody know how long it takes to climb Mount Everest one time? Yeah, two weeks, 10 days, 65 days. 
take 65 days <laughs> of sleeping in a tent and not showering and not seeing your friends. And at that time, like zero connectivity and, and lots of rice and lentils and things <laughs> for 65 days. But the climb, you end up climbing very high up on the mountain and then coming back down to the base camp and resting and then climbing a little bit higher and then going back down and resting to allow your body to adjust to the very extreme altitudes. So to climb Everest one time, you have to climb almost to the summit at least three times just to be ready for that. And it's incredible metaphor. I mean, mountain metaphors, I have to really try to not fall into the cliches for you. But one of the things that is so obvious on Everest is that you have to be working towards a summit that you cannot see until the day that you're gonna go there. And you have to do all that hard work working towards something that you truly cannot see until right before you have the chance to maybe, if you're lucky and everything goes just right, get there. But you need to bring that high level of commitment every single day. And I learned that early on and I loved it. It was something that really suited me and my style of existing. The climbing is difficult, it's steep, it's challenging, it can be dangerous, but it's beautiful. There is no more special moment for me than the moment when you're walking along the ridge towards the highest point on Earth. And I'm sure you've seen images from Everest where there's a bunch of climbers in a line and it just looks like a herd of people. That hasn't been my experience. I've been pretty strategic about how and when I've chosen to climb, but this has been my experience. This is that ridge on a typical summit day one or two people out on that ridge, and it really feels like everything in the world is below you. All your worries, all your concerns, all that rice and lentils that you're gonna have to go back down and eat one more time before you get to go home. <laughs> I was lucky enough that first trip in 2008 when I was 24 to get to the summit with my client and my co-guide. On that climb, I formed a curiosity. I think it was mostly born out of um, I was 24, so it was mostly born out of probably arrogance and naivety. I was like, this wasn't that hard. How do I make this harder? Can I do this without supplemental oxygen? I want to do it on my own. That picture I showed you of that little blonde girl in the snow, one thing had not changed in all of those years. I was fiercely independent as a little girl. I did not want your help with anything. And now here I was, 24, I'd gotten to the summit of Everest, and I felt like, well, that kind of sucked because I had the help of oxygen. I wonder what it'd be like to do it without oxygen. Now, mind you, at this point, less than 30 people, 30 humans had ever done that without supplemental oxygen. Five women ever in the history of time. But I was like, well, why can't I be one of them? So I embarked on a years-long journey to try to achieve that goal. Throughout the years, I had to go and work as a guide on Everest, and I used oxygen on those climbs, and I successfully got to the summit. Other seasons, I tried to climb without oxygen, but I was unable to make it for various reasons, and I chose to use an oxygen mask and go to the summit, and I received the congratulations from people when I came home. In the next seven years, I summited Everest five times. I got sponsorship, I got media recognition, I got praise, but I personally felt rather disappointed because I still was just that fiercely independent little girl who wanted to do it all by myself. You know, I mean, you guys know what I'm saying about the whole thing. It wasn't all good, though. I faced some incredible challenges. The first year that I went to try to climb without oxygen was the next year, 2009. On the way into Everest Base Camp, on the fifth day of the trip, I tripped on the trail, I twisted my ankle, I sprained it very badly, and my leg was bothering me the whole entire climb. And ultimately, I decided I wasn't able to move quick and safely enough, and so I needed to use oxygen if I wanted to go to the summit. So I chose to do that. I came home, went to the doctor, and my leg was broken. And I was like, I just summoned Everest with a broken leg. And the doctor was extremely unimpressed. <laughs> he was like, you just are not that smart. I was like, that might be true. <laughs> In between the spring seasons when I would go and climb on Everest or make an attempt to climb to the summit of Everest, I was going back to Nepal every fall as well. And that was partly because I had started to form some very deep and meaningful connections with the local people. I'd started to slowly learn the language, most of which were bad words to start with, but then I learned that and I started to learn the good words too. One person that I formed a particularly close connection with was Chuang Nima. And he was really, really special. My first summit of Everest in 2008, he was working with our team. He had summited Everest 19 times. It was the second most of any human. 
he was incredibly special. Right after my first climb on Everest, I came back. I had to work on Mount Rainier like the week after my trip ended. And I got up to Camp Mir, and he was sitting there on the steps at Camp Mir. And I was like, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm climbing Mount Rainier. What are you doing here? <laughs> I was like, I also am climbing Mount Rainier. But he was working as a volunteer ranger for the Park Service. And we just formed a really close friendship. In 2010, we were meant to be guiding a trip together in the fall season. But some things happened, our clients canceled, so we both had a little bit of free time. And we decided to go and climb a peak together that both of us were interested in guiding someday, but neither of us had climbed before. On that climb, at about 22,000 feet, on an ice ridge, the ice that he was on collapsed. And he fell to his death. And that day, I was alone, descending. That was a very hard day in my life. But the hardest day of my life was the next day, going to his wife and his two young sons and telling them that he wasn't coming home. And I didn't know what to do. I was completely ill-equipped. I knew that climbing was risky, but I'd never had to face the consequences to that level. And it changed everything for me. And I knew one thing for sure. I wanted to stand in the face of how I could help Part of me wanted to just crawl into a hole and like dig out my marketing degree and go back to work for Procter & Gamble, but I knew that I couldn't be of any help to the local people, to his family, if I left at that point. So I made a personal commitment that as long as I had work in the Himalaya, I would go to her house, I would get to know her, I would get to know the boys, and I would support her with what his salary would have been as long as I possibly could. Over the years, we began to form a close relationship I learned a lot more of the language and was able to communicate with her. And from that relationship, I formed my nonprofit, which is called the Juniper Fund. And what we do is we financially support the families of high altitude workers after a death. And we do that by supporting them with cash donations for five years. And in that time, we give them opportunities for vocational training and small business grants so that they can form income after the loss of a primary income earner. I had no idea what that fund would become. I just wanted to help more people than I possibly could individually. In 2014, I was trying to climb Everest without using supplemental oxygen. Again, I had a single partner. We were just starting the season. And early on, really before the season even started, a devastating avalanche came down in the Kumbu Icefall and killed 16 local workers in one accident. We had just started the Juniper Fund two years prior, and we were ready to support their families. Everything stopped. The climbing stopped. It was an incredible point of reorientation. I thought, you know, what's the point of this? Why am I pursuing this? What does it mean to me? But I still had this nagging question inside. And I wasn't convinced that stopping what I was doing was going to fix anything inside of me or in the world at large. And I also felt like tragedy couldn't happen two years in a row. So in 2015, I went back and I was committed to climbing Everest without using supplemental oxygen. I had a huge media partner. Glamour Magazine was doing a docu documentary series on my climb. And everything was just perfect. And again, about a year and five days after the anniversary of the, the avalanche, a devastating earthquake hit the country of Nepal and killed over 10,000 people in the country, killed 19 people at base camp. And just like that, the Juniper Fund, we expected we would support two to three families a year. We were supporting 48 families. I never imagined that that would be my work, but it is some of the most meaningful work of my life. I really debated stopping climbing, and I certainly debated stopping this pursuit of climbing Everest without oxygen. It felt really insignificant after all I'd seen and all that tragedy, but I couldn't help get to the root of it. Why? Why do I want to do this? Is it for my ego? Is it so that you guys will clap for me when I walk out here? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but mostly, if you remember, that question, that first summit, I had a question. Can I do this? It wasn't about succeeding at doing it. It was about answering the question. And the answer could be no, and that would be OK. But can I do this? And so I committed myself to do some things a little bit differently. And I would go back one more time in 2016, and I would make an attempt. And I would be content with whatever the answer was. And the reason that I felt like this was OK was because it was all about pursuit of curiosity. And curiosity is one of my values. 
And I felt like, you know what, if I'm out there and I'm pursuing one of my values, then it's okay. But I had to make sure that I wasn't doing it so you would clap for me. So I didn't tell any of my sponsors. I didn't tell any of the media. I, in fact, lied and said I wasn't returning to Everest that year, so nobody would know. I decided to go to the other side of Everest, not even in Nepal, the country that I felt the most comfortable in, and climb on a route I'd never been on. I asked my boyfriend to be my climbing partner. He's a mountain guide, not a banker, so it was like a pretty reasonable question. <laughs> but I don't know if you've ever done like a big project with your significant other. It was kind of a big deal to ask him to go with me. And we also decided to do it alone. We wanted to do it by ourselves without the support of any local workers because I didn't feel comfortable ensnaring anybody else in my goal. If I was going to do it, I wanted to only put myself at risk and my boyfriend because that's the deal because he is dating me. <laughs> The climbing route is a little bit different on the north side. It's a little bit more of climbing on the edge of the mountain. On the south side, if you remember that picture, you're kind of cradled inside of the mountain, and that's what I was used to. So I found myself in a little bit of a foreign land, but as soon as I started climbing, it became very familiar. And I realized that one of the things that had happened when I was very young and I started working on Mount Rainier was that I learned the language of the mountains, and it's a universal language. And it's one that everybody in the mountains speaks, regardless of what language, regardless of what their history is, regardless of what their story is. It's a language we all understand. And as we got closer to summit day, so 45 days into this trip, getting higher, getting closer to the chance to actually try this, to pursue that curiosity to its fullest level, I had a feeling. And at 10.30, on the night of May 22nd, we started out climbing after a short hour break of just changing socks and eating some dehydrated mashed potatoes because I'd moved on from rice at that point. <laughs> I knew. I knew it was going to work. I was completely confident that I was going to be able to do it. And I was going to be able to do it by myself. But then as I got higher, I felt something. I realized that I wasn't doing it by myself. I was supported by my father and those goals that he had set for me to pursue happiness. I was supported by my first climbing partners that believed in me enough to show me the ropes, quite literally. I was supported by every single expedition partner that I had had previously who had taught me something about climbing and taught me something about myself. And I was an independent woman, but it was completely different from being alone. And I had always fully misunderstood that. After 14 hours of climbing, I made it to the summit. And I did that as an independent woman, but not alone. And something that I realized in that process is it's really important not to mistake those two things. So that boyfriend, I married him. <laughs> we have a little 10-month-old baby. I decided that I wanted to share everything that I'd learned with the current the former and the next generation. And so I started a mentorship program. And I work with, I say young girls, but that really just means like girls of any age, because my mentees are every age from 12 to 40. And I teach them about leadership, and I teach them about self-confidence, and I teach them how to be a leader and a follower in mixed gender environments, because that's what this world is. And that feels important to me. And so being an independent woman, I've learned, means pursuing goals, that are in line with your values. It means honoring and listening to the wisdom of those that came before you. And it means when you achieve something, taking a couple steps back and gathering up those people that are still on that path and showing them how they can achieve it too. And I am still that dirty-haired little girl in the snow. And I am doing it all by myself. But you guys are doing it with me. So thank you so much.